All right, I started a new video to get rid of that timer out of the corner because it was bugging me. <clears throat> Another thing RESPA has is this thing called the Home Loan Toolkit. It is kind of a gee whiz thing that helps the consumer understand all of what we just talked about. It is a, uh, it's a toolkit. It's on the, uh, the CFPB's website, which allows the homeowner to go in and understand you know, the three-day process. It helps them understand what the loan estimate form is, all of that, okay? RESPA violates unearned fees, kickbacks. Now, I've said this three times. Might be an important factor, you think, okay? Another thing RESPA now has is this thing called the Mortgage Disclosure Improvement Act. What this does is it will record all of the people that are involved in this closing. It's going to record the real estate agent's license number. It may record the mortgage broker's license number. It may record the title company's license number. That way, if there's ever an issue, we can go back and see who was involved in that process to figure out, okay, where's the responsibilities lie? What title company closed this? Well, we got their license number. All of these things, all right? That is just the law to present, uh, prevent the consumer from receiving low interest rates on appli applications because they are all required to disclose all of this stuff to the consumer. Now, when it comes to preparing the closing statement, this is where we are going to have some fun today, all right? It's really simplistic math, but I'm telling you, people get confused with this, but it is really simplistic math because everything on that closing disclosure is either a debit or a credit. That's it. Everything has to be a debit, meaning it's a charge. It's someone must pay this, or it is a credit in the form of something in a person's favor. I'm getting credit for this. So everything on that closing disclosure is nothing more than a buyer's debit or credit and a seller's debit or credit. In the buyer's case, if the debits mean charges are greater than their credits, they must bring money to the table. Think about that. If you don't get it, hit pause for a second. If the buyer's debits, meaning they owe more than they get credit for, the buyer must bring money to the table. And conversely, the seller will have his debits and credits uh, totaled. If his credits are more than his debits, this is money the seller will receive. And the biggest credit to the seller is what? The sales price of the house. There have only been a handful of cases in my career where the seller's debits were bigger than his credits, meaning the seller had to bring money to the table. I'm not saying it can't happen because it most certainly can. It is very rare. So the buyer's debits are more than their credits. They bring money to the table, which is what you see. Buyers got to bring money. The seller's credits are higher than their debits. They receive money at the closing. And all, that's literally all we're going to do is add up each one's debits and their credits and determine the, do they bring money to the table or do they get money at the table? Now, there are several types of expenses that are incurred. Now, I want to warn you on the exam. Please do not read into the exam because I'm going to tell you that theoretically, every one of these expenses can be negotiated between a buyer and a seller. However, there is a specific 
standard on these expenses as to who pays it. So when you see a test question that's going to ask you something about who pays the commission, I do not want you to come to me and go, well, you know, if they would have negotiated, the question didn't say that. Don't read into it. All right. So in the broker's commission, who reads or who pays the broker's commission? The seller pays the broker's commission, right? Because it's part of the listing agreement and the listing agent said, I'm going to charge you 6%. And remember, they're going to split it. I'm going to keep 3% and I'm going to give 3% to the selling agent in order to entice him to bring me a buyer. So even though it may show up on both sides of the column as a buyer and a seller, it's actually paid for by the seller. Attorney's fees. Well, there is an attorney that works for the title company. And because the uh, title company represents both the buyer and seller, meaning they work for both of them, that attorney's fee is probably split 50-50. Now, this is probably one of my biggest uh, pet peeves, and I told you I numbered these, and you guys need to understand this. There is a difference between these two words. There's, people will talk about closing costs. When you go to close, there is a fee called the closing fee. And this is the one that is typically split 50-50. And on the Indiana Purchase Agreement, on the Virginia Purchase Agreement, this is a section that is listed directly in there that says that the buyer and seller agree to split the closing fee 50-50. And what happens is the seller goes, no, dude, I ain't paying half of the buyer's closing costs. That's not what it said. Closing costs are this generic made up term that is the total of all of the fees combined. You've got a closing fee, a recording fee, a courier fee. All right. So you will often have to explain, no, Mr. Seller. That is not saying that you're going to pay half of their closing costs. There is one fee inside of those costs that you will split. This is because the title company works for both the buyer and the seller. So you split that fee 50-50. That is the most common thing. Now, once again, could be negotiated. There are recording fees. Each party has their own recording fees, right? The new buyer wants to record the IOU and the mortgage because the bank told them they had to. The seller wants to record the release of their lien because they're going to pay it off with the money the buyer's giving them. Some states have a transfer tax, which is typically paid for by the seller. There are title fees. Remember, we talked about the owner's policy and the lender's policy. So each one has that. Then there's a group here that typically is, oh, let me go this way. Paid for by the buyer. Obviously, right? The buyer gets the loan. So the loan fees, the buyer has to put money in those impound accounts. So those are buyer fees. The lender requires the buyer to pay for an appraisal, so that's a buyer's fee. The survey, the lender wants to see, so the buyer's going to have to pay that. And then there could be any kind of additional fees that are involved. Could be a survey in there, uh, uh, a different type of survey. There could be any kind of other fees that could be associated. Now, there is a problem in the fact that there are some fees that must be prorated between the buyer and the seller. Prorated means there's a division of that fee 
because of whatever it is, can be divided. The two most common ones are real estate taxes. And I'm going to say the other one is homeowners associations. A good example is uh, another is the fuel in an oil tank, right? Because when the seller took or the buyer took over, it was half full. So there are some items that have to be prorated. The two most common items that I told you are real estate taxes and HOA fees. Real estate taxes, because they are paid on an annual basis and HOA fees, which typically are paid on an annual basis. Even if they're paid on a monthly basis, they could be prorated because you're going to close at some date in the middle of the month. All right. So proration is nothing more than a division of this fee so that it can be appropriated some of it to the buyer and some of it to the seller. How do we do that? Here comes the fun with math today. So let's talk about the, these types of fees. The first thing you need to know is there are two styles. There is what we call a prepaid fee. And then there is what is called an accrued fee. A prepaid fee is paid before you use it. An accrued fee is paid after you use it. Now, here's the good thing on the exam. You are not going to be required to know that taxes are prepaid or they're accrued. Doesn't matter. Because all prepaid bills act alike. It doesn't matter what the bill is. It could be prepaid cellular. It could be your HOA that's prepaid. It could be your real estate taxes that are prepaid. So you are not going to be required to know which specific bill is either prepaid or accrued. Because also, that may be different in every state. So understand that the exam will say, using a prepaid bill, that's all you really need to know. Because it doesn't matter what it is, it only matters that it was paid before. Or it may say using an accrued bill. Once again, doesn't matter. It was accrued means it's paid at the end. So let's look at a couple examples.